What is your opinion on Hindutva politics? There is no need to be anxious or no need to be afraid of your rights. You know, we all are possessive about Kaveri. This century is a century of uh, water wars. Welcome to Yuva vs Neta, a special edition ahead of the Karnataka Assembly election in May. And this is part of the election meter that we are organizing as part of Asianet Newsable. We are here at the campus of a college called Com. It's a journalism college. We have a bunch of students who are going to be the Yuva, and we have BJP leader Mr. Vivek Reddy, uh, who will be our Neta for the day. Uh, as I start off with the show, let me actually give you a heads up. Are students really interested in politics? If yes, then brilliant. If not, then why not? Is there a serious trouble that Karnataka as well as politics is undergoing right now? Um, let me go to the first student. Are you really interested in politics? Hmm, as, I've, uh, as I've started college and started understanding the problems within the city, I have understood that politics plays I would say the single biggest role and how important my vote is, I have come to realize its importance. And I have also come to realize how diplomatically and how uh, strategically politicians play the game. Okay. Uh, that was Vignesh for you, but then what is interesting is that there is a student among uh, these people here who is determined not to vote. Will you actually tell me why are you not interested in voting? Uh, because it's always, uh, it's just said it's nothing is done. So I know even one vote does matter, but I just chose not to vote because there's nothing that's really happening. So I see the change only then I'll make it a point where I vote and it really does matter. My vote deserves politicians. Does your vote really deserve politicians? Now I bring Vivek Reddy in. Mr. Vivek Reddy, do you really want to answer that? Why do people not want to vote? Is it just a bag full of empty promises? I think um, over the years perhaps particularly the younger generations from when they have been uh, uh, in into what what they have seen in daily news what they have seen in india i think uh, the blame lies on us the politicians because we have created a lot of distrust and we have betrayed a lot of hopes that is one thing that um, politicians have failed but um, the larger issue is uh, i'd like you to consider it this way in all fields of life today in India, India is excelling. And uh, in the private sphere, every, every private sphere, be it technology, be it manufacturing, or be it anything else that you take in this world, India is getting to number one everywhere. So my question is, why can't we get to number one in politics also? So why should there be private success only and public failures? We should, we are entering an era where we need to see those, that public success. And for that, the youth must come up. It is the youth that must stand up and say, look here, this is our nation. We will take hold of the nation. We are stakeholders. And we will ensure we will elect the right people. And we will ensure there's public success. To talk about that. Of course, all of us would love to see many more youngsters getting into politics. But then, youngsters are really dissuaded by the way things function in politics today. Would you really agree with me? One of the basic amenities, like water, for example. How do you actually see it? Are you really frustrated with politics? Do you feel that politicians will fetch you no water? And that is why you do not really want to make any kind of change, but just live with it? Uh, I definitely wouldn't want to live with it. I come from Coog, and uh, I know my father is a farmer. And uh, we, we actually live almost on the banks of the river. And yes, Kaveri. And we are not allowed to use water for ourselves, while a lot of water is shifted to, uh, you know, given to Bangalore. So I see this whole, uh, there's a shift between, give, uh, shift where you're giving a lot of importance to the urban people and not as much to the rural people. We're not allowed to use water, water even for drinking facilities. And I find that very uh, sad because 
you know we all are possessive about kaveri but when it comes to using something that is natural like very natural to us the municipality doesn't give us water but at the same time we are not allowed to use it they are confiscating our motors and everything because we are not allowed to use it for irrigation or even drinking well so, kaveri is not really an issue uh, between the states but also an issue between regions of the same state interesting how uh, would you like to answer that yes i think it's a question of um, allocation of water we have de definitely a scarce resource if we consider one issue many uh, uh, experts world experts on water have um, declared that this century is a century of uh, water wars where there will be wars on water because human population is increasing the resources are limited so that scarcity calls for equitable and proportional allocation so what she what uh, uh, with your good name Malavika, what Malavika is making out is a good point. Now we are fighting between states, but what about equitable allocation intrastate? These questions remain unanswered. Definitely, there is no uh, formula for such. Since allocation. you touched upon allocation, there is an interesting uh, uh, point that has been raised in the recent past with regards to uh, the allocation of funds between the north and the south, and this disparity has been raised by Karnataka CM Siddharamaiah. And uh, in fact, uh, to add on to that, I have another student here who p wants to pose a question. Um, so yeah, so we all have seen the recent video which clearly states the division of uh, taxes. So what's your take on it? Is it right for us to pay so much for the whole country? Or uh, do you really think there should be a, there should be equality in that? Yes, we are, we are at a stage, at a challenging stage in this country's future this generation, like the previous generation had freedom as, a, as the biggest goal, we have poverty alleviation as the biggest goal, this generation, all of us. And all of us have a right, have a duty to contribute towards it. So therefore, the tax enlargement where Modi brought in, Mr. Modi brought in several lakhs and crores of other taxpayers into the net is a huge gain for India. This is one. Second thing is the other point that you were making, that uh, the allocation of taxes, the tax money. Well, Sidramaya has been given about 1,69,000 crores than the earlier governments. This is almost a 150% increase, 125 to 150% increase in the allocation for Karnataka, despite the restructuring in taxes and due to, despite the uh, first year of uh, minimum dividends in the taxes after the restructuring, after demonetization. But still, over the past five years, having received more, what we are spending in Karnataka is about 50% of the target. So that's, that's all documented. If you're really suggesting that the remaining 50% is getting pocketed uh, by it's, politicians. It's unutilized and whatever is utilized, there's not much of accountability. That's the biggest problem in our country. That boils down also to corruption. Is corruption really one of the key agendas, especially while catering to the urban youth? How do you see corruption? Uh, corruption, I guess, uh, it depends on every individual because uh, today if I feel that I need to bribe someone and then uh, I need to um, do the work, then uh, I think it's upon me after all. So uh, I want to, uh, like I always think that when it comes to the politicians, because uh, I don't have that much power in my hands, but they do have. So um, we all say that there is corruption, there is corruption, but how do we cater to it? How do we tackle it? How do we solve the problem? Not 100%, but at least 5% maybe of the total thing. So I, th I think it will lead to development. So how can we do it? How can they do it better for us? And even yesterday, there, was, uh, 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 there were these uh, reports suggesting that even Mr. Yadurapa, the CM face of the BJP, uh, is also allegedly involved in a 40 crore scam. So when the CM face can have these allegations pointed against him, how are people going to really believe these politicians to suggest that corruption will be eradicated? Yeah, see, well, well uh, there is one, one or two uh, issues here. No doubt, we have to question every political party, we have to question every leader. That is an open frame of mind with which every political party has to sit in politics. It has to be observed, it has to be questioned, because democracy dies in darkness. There has to be something, an open form of questioning. But the larger issue is, whatever you are suggesting, whenever a leader is alleged to have participated in certain graft charges, 
the Congress at this stage in Karnataka has forgotten that it is the Congress's report card that we are testing. The diversions that the politicians create or political parties create are immense to enable us to clearly lose focus. So that we have to keep that focus in mind. And the question that you posed, what, what about Mr. Yadurapa? Let me tell you that after Modi has come in 2014, it is Modi's era. Modi's era is a transformative journey. Two major questions for you. So my first question is, what is your opinion on Hindutva politics, especially in a secular uh, city like Bangalore? Because as a, as a urban uh, citizen, I clearly do not understand what is a big issue with uh, the beef ban and why do we have ambulances for cows when people are dying in the hospitals, kids are dying in the hospitals without oxygen cylinders and what was Yogi Adityanath's purpose in coming and telling our government how to run the state. That is one and one more thing is I clearly know that demonetization was a flop. And uh, I clearly do not know why is, uh, with all due respect to Narendra Modi about how high he has come up, it is, it is still a flop and that is something that the BJP has to accept and has to make amends. It, it cannot still give the uh, agenda that um, there were certain positives that came out of demonetization. More than 99% of the money actually Actually, what happened was black money got converted into white money. Whenever you enlarge the tax base, they become permanent depositors of tax. Every year they have to file returns. And the resultant uh, benefit to the country, where you have, if you double the number of taxpayers, it's an amazing achievement. So if you take that single achievement as part of demonetization, I think it has achieved its objective. So far as corruption is concerned, so far as uh, trans-border uh, for black money, trans-border, uh, you know, minting money is concerned. Well, these are issues which we have to see later. So far as corruption is concerned, yes, there was definitely an earnest attempt to curb corruption, but corruption is a mindset. But today, uh, let me ask you one question that really concerns us. You look at, uh, we are working so hard. I am a pro lawyer by pro profession. You are uh, becoming budding journalists who will contribute to this nation and also serve this nation. We are working so hard, but we find some politician's son making all the money and then enjoying without having to work hard. Or we see some politician doing it, having grand and big houses. This is all out of lifted from public money. So these are the challenges which we face. Are we telling our children that look here, you be like that rather than work hard like us? So therefore, the larger two issues that you raised, one, the benefits of demonetization, and the larger values that we have to instill in our society, these become important issues. So far as Hindutva is concerned, that which was an issue that you raised, so far as Hindutva is concerned, well, I, I, I for one believe that this is a nation where the politicians, the leaders will have to assure people from both communities that look here, there is no need to be anxious or no need to be afraid of your rights. That is what has to happen here. What happens with politicians is, they start over appeasement of one section. The other section gets against it. And why do you have to do it? Why do you have to play those chess pawns as if it is some larger cunning goal that you have to achieve? Why don't you be, why don't you see everybody equally? Talking of appeasement politics, I mean, that is one thing that is actually ruling the roost. On one hand, you have uh, somebody uh, or the two political parties talking about who is the real Hindu. Or on the other hand, you have uh, uh, somebody playing the Lingayat card and the opposition playing the Dalit card. Is that all? Does religion really matter when it comes to politics? Or is it about the common people and successful governance? Is there anyone who wants to add to this? I don't feel uh, that religion should be part of anything, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, politics and everything. But deviating from that, uh, so I would want to ask you, sir, when, as a youngster, so one thing, so again deviating from the topic, when I think about politics, like when do we get to that stage where we get a positive vibe? Because as soon as I think about politics, it's nothing that I think about, you know, something positive or uh, it's always involved with money. Money and religion. I think um, uh, you have raised a, a problem which has struck such deep roots in our society. 
it was as deep as the british government perhaps in 1857 when we, st we when we started our first war of independence to uproot the british government it took us 90 years thereafter up to 1940 1947 i don't think we have so much time our generation is impatient we want changes now but this definitely the evil that you point out is very deep and so deep that to uproot it will take time at least one way of beginning is there are two or three ways of beginning one is that you need to bring in good leaders and how do you know who which leaders are good because you never know until you test them so only it is it is only through a process of testing and i would request you kindly test new people kindly test new youngsters because the younger generation that is coming up definitely wants to see radical changes a lot of transformation in politics we want politics to work we want the bureaucracy to work we want you know we don't want traffic chaos if there is traffic chaos there is there are certain people responsible they must come and fix it so that governance culture must change this is one second thing is so long as people during elections about 20 to 30% i was telling pratibha also about 30% of the electorate you have to pay them to buy votes if you don't pay the rival party pays and this has become the common brand in politics today so where does the politician get money for this he will loot the treasury but sensible citizens will say like us like you and me will say when you are looting my house you think i will i will uh, keep quiet this is my house this is my nation you are looting it so we will we we will definitely you know go very there is a fury against it so we are caught in this vicious politics there has to be a full stop somewhere and that can be done when perhaps you look at narendra modi there was so much of graft in central government but now he has fixed it so you need one leader to fix it and that's the way it goes it's not it may not be a permanent or a full proof solution 100% solution that i am suggesting but at least it gets us there since you spoke of culture in governance um, has politics really boiled down to you know a very tutu meme game between uh, the politicians rather than really pointing to successful governance how many of you play lemon and spoon here have you once played it in your lives yeah. yes it's boiled down to a person carrying a lemon why is he carrying a lemon or it has boiled down to a person having a garland over his neck just thrown from somewhere so or is it about uh, you know politics and uh, the beef ban and making a video out of it and which becomes a viral video on social media is that all politics is about rather than giving a report card like you really pointed out and i think to add to my question there is another student here so yeah that was the question i wanted to ask you as well i went through your twitter account and i've gone through a few other congress and bjp members uh, accounts and all i see is each uh, you know bickering against each other as a youth i i don't care whether you're congress or bjp unlike my parents who who clearly have like a bjp uh, you know they they fully support bjp or congress so i don't see i don't see any sort of grace in any of the politicians uh, i mean I, it doesn't hurt to once in a while appreciate what the other other party does or highlight it it's all grace and i think what we learn from our elders and the young politicians that we see today they think politics is just about you know accusing the uh, other party and we've learned that from our elders which is the older generation of uh, politics so what do you have to say to that don't you think we need to have a little more grace when it comes to running our country yes definitely the modern politics calls for a change calls for a transformation and the assessment should be on development definitely that is something we must get out of this blame game mud slinging politics and uh, mud slinging to such an extent that we don't mind bringing down erected houses of lingayats let us say for 900 years a religion is evolved we say that all right bring down that religion i want my vote so that sort of a brinkmanship politics has to change the very short answer that i can give Sorry, you is to add to that there is also bring down the lingayat yes on the other hand we will uh, we will play the dalit card too to counter that yes yes i mean on both sides on both sides there must be a stoppage of emotional issues one uh, i also have another question 
question. You pre previously mentioned that the ruling party has to rise above religion, you know, divide and rule based on religion. But don't you think with uh, Narendra Modi coming into power, we've seen we've seen like a real surge in and uh, anti-Muslim and pro-Hindu movements. Well, what do you have to say to that? Let me tell you one thing. This requires some explanation. India is a country of 1.2 billion people. Narendra Modi is not in control of any sentimental explosion that happens in a village. It is impossible to expect a Prime Minister to be in control. It can happen in a BJP ruled state. It can happen in a Congress ruled state. But what has happened is, the media in India, we are all journalists. You should also know that there is a, Pratibha may later tell me, I don't know to which wing she belongs. But media is polarized. And I don't know about your awareness about that. Of course, you will be aware of it. Media is polarized in such a way that when a Congress government comes, the far right strikes at Congress and strikes at every issue. Now, when, the, when BJP is in government, the far left also starts throwing stones on the BJP. But look at it this way. Narendra Modi in the four, past four, four, three and a half, four years has not given any disturbing news so far as his governance is concerned to the far left, who are waiting to throw stones at him. This is practical reality, what is happening there. One mistake by Narendra Modi, one graft case by Narendra Modi, if at all. There is no such case, so there will be no such case because of his very clear stand on corruption. Since you also touched upon media and uh, the kind of uh, political le uh, leanings that each of them would have, not just the politicians but even the media, that also boils down to freedom of expression which is one thing that the journalists have been really worried about. Do you really want to add to that? Yes, uh, so I have, a, I have quite a few questions. Yes, but go ahead. Your good name? <laughs> Lakshmi. So first being, while you were talking, it kind of, um, to me it sounded like you're blaming the b media for being polarized. We are, it's not about being polarized. We are the watchdogs of the government. It is our duty to be like that so that we have to give the report cards. I think the media is giving the report cards more than the opposition. Also, another thing is, um, uh, that's what I wanted to add on. Another thing is, uh, the whole of government is filled with red tapism. We are hanging on red tapism. And that's one of the biggest reasons at grassroots levels we cannot eliminate corruption. So if, if you are going to be the next leader of uh, BTM, what, what can you do as a single person? You yourself told that Modi being one person, he, can, he might not be able to do anything about the blasts or if, even the cows with vigilantism that's happening in one part of the village. Yes. So what, as yes. a leader, what I are think, you going to I do? I think in, uh, let me just... Yes, Vignesh. So, so you said that Modi is not responsible for what happens in the villages, for all of the lynchings that take place. And contradicting to that, you also say that Modi is directly responsible for Swaj Bharat, for cleaning our streets. So when he can set a strong example in the case of Swaj Bharat, in the case of uh, going payless, going cashless, why can't he set the same example when it comes to stop these lynchings? That why is can't because. he go to the hospital here? So most of... And one more big question that all of the youth have is, what is BJP without Modi because there is so much promotion on him it is like it sounds like a dictatorship to me as a common citizen I mean what is BJP without Modi? I'll tell you one issue is a legislator first of all he becomes a moving Sakal you know the Sakal legislation Sakal legislation is where within three days or within five days works have to be done by the government now, a legislator stands as a moving sakal. If somebody in the constituency comes, outside the constituency comes and says, look here, sir, my work is not being done, he has to get it done then and there without waiting for the sakal. That is a legislator's task. So, he eliminates the red tapism. That is his work. Second thing is, there are so much of urban, there is so much of urban chaos that we see around us. He takes responsibility for that. He has to set it right. My goal for BTM, for example, is, that's what I've been telling the electorate, the citizens. I want to create end-to-end -end footpaths to, to make it walkable. I want to make it, you know, the infrastructure, discipline the infrastructure, make it very good. So these are, have a vision city. These are the things. 
Then the next issue is a legislator becomes a lawmaker. So he must have an idea as to what are the laws that he is making, what sort of laws he needs to bring to change society. The fourth thing is a legislator must have an idea on the values, on where society is moving. As a society, where are we moving? Uh, I did cleverly notice that you have diplomatically avoided the freedom of expression. No, I do. I wanted to come to that. <laughs> right, Please, I'll come second. to that also. Uh, uh, also, this question for now. Yes. And uh, and Vignesh's questions. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, as uh, uh, as we know that it's not always one po one political party is always right and the other party is always wrong. So usually, and uh, once what happened was uh, uh, Congress came up with this Aadhaar card. Okay, so then we had this, uh, we, uh, we saw the Narendra Modi, how he told, uh, it's of uh, no use, making the Aadhaar card, it's of no use, and um, it's a, the uh, government is wasting just uh, so and so money. So now, today, we know that Aadhaar card is so, this thing for us, be it for uh, domestic gas, or um, for uh, linking it for Aadhaar card, even for SIM. So in case if uh, BJP is telling us now that Aadhaar card is a big thing now for us, why, do, why didn't you guys uh, support co Congress that time? Yeah, it is true, Aadhaar card is going to be a big uh, uh, issue in the future. So far as um, security is concerned, it's a very easy answer. We are still in an unregulated uh, regime. Even Facebook and world over, America, and uh, Russia's data theft or influencing uh, American elections are all examples of how technology has progressed but law has not been able to keep pace, even in those countries. So we are trying to gain momentum and then reach them. So that's where we lie and we have to bring in a lot of regulate, uh, regulatory regime, a regulatory architecture in order to freeze that. So that is where it is. So far as Aadhaar is concerned, I think the larger concerns of Aadhaar during uh, Congress regime was that non-Indians were able to get Aadhaar easily than Indians. That is, Bangladeshis were able to get Aadhaar. The Rohingya Muslims and Bangladeshis were able to get Aadhaar than uh, real Indians. So therefore, the Indian taxpayers' money was not going to the Indian poor, but was going to persons, no doubt they are also humans, but was going to persons who were non-Indians through the cunning process of getting themselves registered. So there, were, there, there was a big breach. That was a concern which Modi had and that is now being addressed through the regulatory mechanism of making it more stricter. Now, this, so far as freedom of speech is concerned, I think you're right. There must be the freedom in this country to oppose, to criticize, and to lay every issue to the forefront, bring every issue to the forefront against any political party, against any leader. That is the free regime that we are looking at. Yesterday in the big debate, I mean, it's going to be um, recorded today, it was recorded yesterday, in the big debate in NDTV, they said that in India there is a Soviet style of uh, you know, suppressing free speech. There is a Soviet style of suppressing speech, free speech. One of the journalists said, it was a panel of uh, uh, leading journalists in Delhi. So I said, for the past 20 years, you have criticized our leader. You have brought every allegation against him that he had to pass. He had to pass that test. You have raised every sort of uh, accusation against him. You have criticized his poli policies. You have berated against him in every manner possible. It has been street fights, virtually, for Mr. Modi. And after having permitted you to do that, I mean, it's not permission, the freedom is there to do it. How can you say it is Soviet, Soviet style of free speech, where, you know, Putin does not allow any dissenting voices to come up. That is not the sort of free, free speech regime that is there in India. It is absolutely free. And you can attack any leader, any person politically. But the issue is, the larger issue is, don't try to make, don't try to turn the facts. Suppose there are certain facts, you report the facts, you interpret the facts, but don't try to falsify the facts. That is the issue, whether on the left or the right. Free speech stops there. Free speech stops, the freedom stops where you try to manipulate the facts, you try to insert facts, you fabricate facts. That is not the regime that we are looking at because it leads to a lot of mischief and a lot of communal problems also. All of you will have to step up. You youngsters hold the you know, future of this country. And you will have to come up and, say, and try to change the system. I'll have to close the session Thank for you. now. Budding journalists, so budding ideas and many more questions that are also brewing in their minds. But then since we are Great. Thank you. short of time.
Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Vivek Reddy, and thank you so much all of these uh, budding journalists here. Let's hope that one day they will also try to make a change just like we all expect uh, the politicians to make a change. Thank you so much, you viewers, for watching this particular show and encouraging us. Let us hope that Karnataka elections will actually be a turnaround for many more youngsters to get into politics and learn about politics. Thanks so much for watching. You're watching Yuva versus Neta.